Long before my people journeyed to this land, your people were here. And you received from your elders an understanding of creation and of the mystery that surrounds us all that was deep and rich and to be treasured. We did not hear you when you shared your vision. In our zeal to tell you of the good news of Jesus Christ, we were closed to the value of your spirituality. We confused Western ways and culture with the depth and breadth and length and height of the gospel of Christ. We imposed our civilization as a condition of accepting the gospel. We tried to make you be like us, and in so doing, we helped to destroy the vision that made you what you were. As a result, you and we are poorer, and the image of the creator in us is twisted, blurred, and we are not what we are meant by God to be. We ask you to forgive us and to walk together with us in the spirit of Christ so that our peoples may be blessed and God's creation healed. The Right Reverend Bob Smith, General Counsel, 1986, the United Church of Canada. Good morning. For those of you who haven't met me, my name is Reverend Katie Avon. I'm the Minister of Congregational Care here at Bedford United Church. The place that we call Bedford is also called Quipec, which in the Mi'kmaq language means the place where the river meets the basin. There are multiple treaties between the Mi'kmaq Nation and the British Crown beginning with the Treaty of Peace and Friendship signed in 1725 in Latio, Annapolis Royal, and ratified the following year in Shibuktu, Halifax. All of these treaties were diplomatic measures to allow people to coexist on the land. They were not treaties about the land. As such, we acknowledge that we are on unceded Mi'kmaq land. We acknowledge that the Mi'kmaq people continue to live and steward this land as they have done for a millennia. Today, this land is home to many peoples, indigenous, settler, and newcomers. Bedford United Church is less than 10 kilometers from two Mi'kmaq communities, both on the Hammonds Plains Road. We acknowledge our responsibility to be reconciled with all Indigenous peoples across Canada and Turtle Island. As followers of Jesus, we commit ourselves as a community of faith to being learners, listeners, and seekers of justice until this reconciliation is complete. May it be so. Good morning, church. Good morning, friends. BUC. My name is Reverend Gloria Churchill, and I'm honored to be your presider for the month of June. We gather from near and far all across Canada, and we are so grateful that we are able to do so virtually this morning. Now, there's a lot in today's service, so you'll please bear with me for a moment as we have our announcements. There is a contemplative Bible study um, taking place in the month of June, and it starts next Tuesday. So if you're interested, please check it out on our website, call the church office to register. I'm sure they'd love to have you get together for this uh, scripture study. Today, we also mark the day when BUC became an affirming congregation so many years ago, a milestone in uh, the life of our church. But we also note that the Inclusivity Committee has made a decision to have the larger celebration to coincide with the um, Pride Parade in August. Hopefully by then we'll be able to celebrate in person. We also remember and celebrate today the uh, anniversary of Church Union in 1925. And in the wake of the recent discovery in Kamloops, we're reminded of the promises we made as a community of faith, as a denomination, a denomination that it believes in reconciliation and justice. We get, begin our worship now by lighting our candles. 
Now, I wish I had a sidekick like Jackson with me. He did a great job last month, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have a sidekick. I did bring a teddy bear in memory of uh, those children whom we mourn today. So as I light our Christ candle, we say God is here all the time. God is here in this beautiful creation and in our lives. And we light our inclusivity candle. We say all are welcome all the time. All are welcome. I'd like to share with you now a poem by Abigail Echo Hawk. This was circulating on Facebook this week, and we thought it appropriate to share with you today. When they buried the children, what they didn't know, they were lovingly embraced by the land. Held and cradled in a mother's heart, the trees wept for them, with the wind, they sang morning songs. Their mothers didn't know how to sing, bending branches to touch the earth around them. The Creator cried for them, the tears falling like rain. Mother Earth held them until they could be found. Now our voices sing the morning songs with the trees and the wind. Light, sacred fire, ensure they are never forgotten as we sing justice. Over to you, Tony. Good morning, friends. My name is Tony Janes, and I am the music ministry lead here at Bedford United Church. Well, here in my house right now. I miss seeing your faces. I miss worshiping together with you in person. But I know that time will come again. In the meantime, we'll continue to connect our spirits through the internet. Today, as we spend some time in worship, remembering those who've been affected by the terrible news that we heard this week, let's focus on peace, love, restoration, healing, and children. And let's lift up our God together. And I know that as we do, God's presence will fill us with joy. Amen. Brothers 
church, let us walk together, seeking justice, healing shame, filled with hope imbued with courage. Every violence we will name. People. Today's reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 17 to 26. In this passage, we find Jesus, as we often do, surrounded by a crowd of people. While some have come to witness his ministry and miracles with open hearts and minds, others have come to scrutinize. It is noted at the start that the Pharisees and experts in the law are among the crowd to see for themselves who is this so-called prophet and under what authority he presumes to speak on behalf of God. Jesus shows them in a very profound way just how real his connection is to God. One day, as Jesus was teaching, there were Pharisees and experts in the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of God was present for Jesus to heal the sick. Then some people appeared, carrying a paralyzed person on a mat. They tried to carry the individual into the house to set in front of Jesus, but the crowd made it impossible to get in. So they went up on the roof, made an opening in the tiles, and lowered the paralyzed one into the middle of the gathering in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said, My friends, your sins are forgiven you. The religious scholars and the Pharisees began to murmur among themselves. Who is this person talking blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their thoughts, responded to them and said, Why do you harbor such thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Get up and walk? But to prove to you that the Chosen One has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he turned to the paralyzed person, I tell you, get up, take up your mat, and go home. Immediately the individual stood up in front of them, picked up the mat, and went home, praising God. They were all filled with awe and praised God, saying, We have seen some remarkable things today. May our understanding of Jesus' teachings bring about our own deeper connection with God. 
Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reverend Matthew Fillier, and I'm the lead minister at Bedford United. After our latest series last week, I got a powerful question from a friend of mine who asked, so, how can we take the tough stuff in life and be taught to use it as energy? Well, if going marveling is just for the sake of a Sunday walk, it becomes what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called a mysticism that's nothing more than the soul chattering away to itself. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we've got enough echo chambers on the go as it is, right? If our spirituality has no social, political, moral, and ethical consequences for our neighbors and how we relate to them, let alone for our fellow creatures and the planet that we share, then it is bankrupt of God's spirit and energy. It's just vanity. During our series, we observe that energy doesn't die, it transforms. So, what kind of energy can transform evil and injustice. We're talking about the sinful colonial energy of oppression and death that led the attempted systemic genocide of entire indigenous peoples, culture, and civilization. And the abominable terror that's been brutally obvious to our indigenous neighbors for generations is confronting Canadians anew. 215 children, little kids, some only three years old, buried in a pit, not a grave, a pit. Those kids never came home. And there's more, there's more to be discovered. This, this is genocide. Without gallows, without firing squads, without even keeping accurate records, Canadian institutions and society, including the churches, including the United Church of Canada, poured energy into these schools dedicated to culturally and spiritually erasing entire peoples in the name of the public good because they threatened the colonial order. They didn't fit the settler blueprint of well-behaved, taxable Christian citizens in the Great North strong and free. They had to be fixed. Or they were broken in the process. If you agree with Simone Weil that human beings are the intersection of God and nature, then a lot hinges on this question. Can that energy, can that trauma that's passed through generations in the matter and molecules that are living human bodies, can it be transformed? Can it be reconciled? Nothing less than the power of resurrection is going to move that mountain. As a person of faith, and I use that word with the fullness of doubt, uncertainty, and humility I believe it entails, I believe it's possible. And I recognize that's easy for me to say. I believe that love and justice can transform and heal and bring new life. How else can we live with ourselves and our past if it can't? How else can every child ever matter if it can't? How can we believe in life beyond death if we're forever paralyzed in the tomb? Do we believe this energy can be transformed? Now, our response to guilt and shame is predictable. We want to fix it. We want to settle it. We want to make it go away as fast as possible. Individuals and societies seem to do this in more ways than can ever be counted. But energy can't be fixed. It transforms. You know, last week, Iris Murdoch said, Love is the extremely difficult realization that something other than yourself is real. Settlers are being called to give our fullest loving attention to our indigenous neighbors. For up to this point, we have not loved our neighbor in a way that honors the spirit of the creator that is in everyone and everything. Remember the goal of giving the fullness of your loving attention? It was to see the other person justly, honestly, and compassionately. 
Doing so means we move away from universality and generalizations and labels, and we move towards increasing depth and intimacy and particularity. Well, it doesn't get much more intimate than discovering the remains of 215 children have been buried beneath our feet this whole time. For generations, Canadians have been happy to reap the blessings of the doctrine of discovery. Are we courageous enough to reconcile its sins and curses too, for the sake of our neighbor and every child that lives in this land? Are we prepared to give our loving attention that sees the other in the fullness of their truth rather than trying to hide it behind conspiracy theories and institutional uh, dickering and, and pits of death? If there's life beyond death, we first have to learn to see the wound, to marvel at the Easter sunrise. We first intentionally turn and face the cross. What keeps us from reconciling the nails of colonial racism driven into the fabric of our nation? What stands in our way from transforming that into the resurrection energy of new life? Well, I think the paralysis of privilege for starters. Now, let me explain. Suppose that you had suffered a trauma so severe you couldn't move, let alone stand. You're trapped. Reliving the horror cycle of abuse and death that doggedly pursues your days. Infecting all your relationships, your work, your mental health, your spirit. You'll do anything to numb and escape its reach. Trauma is a living energy. It takes up residence in your bones. It doesn't let go easily. How do you get over a child taken from your arms who never came home? But your friends, your ancestors, they have faith. Faith that there is new life, that healing is possible. Your family, your elders, your siblings in the spirit, they won't give up on you. So they carry you to a source of healing where there is balm for your wounds to be bound up. But there's a problem. A crowd stands in the way. A great mass of a wall that will not move. Your friends make their plea. It's life and death down here, but the wall stands fast. You don't get the time of day, let alone their attention, because there's no room left. They've earned their spots in the mortar of the system, and there are only so many spots, don't you know? Their ancestors worked hard for the life they now enjoy. They deserve it. This is the paralysis of privilege. I can't give you my loving attention because it would cost me too much to see you as my neighbor. Your friends try to push through, but they're met with indifference and scorn. They hear, so what? You're in pain. Well, so am I. Is your pain greater than mine? If I see yours, I'm scared it will invalidate my pain and I'll lose my place in the line. So move yourselves along. We were here first and we even planted a flag and built a statue to prove it. The wall is built in the shape of an institution and bureaucracy that leaves your friends groping for some gap. And every time they think they found a way in, they get crowded out by rules and legislation and the passing of the buck that declares your life is not worth as much as a brick that should make everyone loony, let alone sick. The trauma of residential school system lives in human bodies. It lives in this land and what has been built upon it. Can that energy be transformed? Can it be reconciled? It was so hard to get in. The friends breached the roof so the suffering of their loved one could be seen and cared for. That's what it took. Our indigenous neighbors can relate. Has the hard heart of Canada been breached finally by 215 children when generations of evidence and apologies were clearly not enough? Has that hard heart been pierced in its side, finally open to giving this wound its full and undivided attention? 
Are we going to enact the Truth and Reconciliation Act in this country, in our church, in our lives? Are we going to force First Nations to the courts to prove that this happened yet again and that the Canadian government is liable? Can that energy be transformed? Or is the paralysis of privilege permanent? Jesus and the Pharisees, they were all Jews who believed in reform. And the Pharisees sought to preserve a system of ritual and tradition because all around them, they were being invaded by forces from other empires and nations. So their motto was, protect and preserve our identity at all costs. Now, for Jesus, there was no system that could hold the force of life, of love. It couldn't be fixed or preserved or saved because it just is. God is God all the time, no matter whose land we're on or how many statues we make. Like all the stars, like the lilies, like the children, energy doesn't need to be fixed. It is for everyone and everything that seeks it. Now, remember, Jesus is crucified because of blasphemy, at least in part. If it takes blasphemy to teach the dry bones of people so paralyzed by their privilege how to dance into resurrection, if that's what it takes for our spirituality to have moral, ethical, social, political consequences that usher in the kingdom for all, then so be it. That's why Jesus went to the cross, you know? Like this whole John 3.16 thing, it's really about giving your loving attention. Aren't we tired of being just another face in the crowd while indigenous people have had to raise the roof, let alone the dead, literally for generations to seek justice and reconciliation? Instead of being just another brick in the wall, how about we help part the Red Sea, huh? I mean, I humbly submit that the miracle of this story is less about the one who picks up their mat and walks. The energy of healing and justice brings the resurrection of new life. I've seen it. I've met survivors who are little, literal proof. So have many of you. The thing that should leave us slack-jawed with wonder is that the wall comes down enough for the crowd to see it for what it is to free themselves from the paralysis of privilege that causes them to, and I quote, be filled with awe because they see remarkable things, wondrous things, marvelous things today. Well, today it can start with us. Let's do our part as settlers or newcomers to transform the energy of injustice into reconciliation for every child. In community and in constant conversation with them, let's enable more space for our indigenous friends to break through. We will be circulating a list of ways that you can intentionally live and move differently for reconciliation. Break the paralysis of privilege. Learn, explore, advocate, open your mind, open your heart. I hope that as a church, if each of us does at least one of the things on this list, we can take at least 215 steps that move us in a different direction. The first step to bringing down that wall is understanding what it's made of in the first place. So this Sunday, let's do much more than go for a walk after church. Let's make the road of love and justice by walking with our friends until even the bricks must shout. Now that would be marvelous indeed. Friends, the spirit in me honors the spirit in you. And all the people said, Amen. I want to go where the rivers cannot overflow me, where my feet are on a rock. I want to hide where the blazing fire of life cannot burn me, in your presence, O oh God, in your presence. Claire.
left of the rock. In your presence, O oh God, I want to hide where the flood of sorrow cannot reach me, where I'm covered by your Shadows of darkness cannot touch me in your presence, oh God, in your presence, that's where I am strong, in your presence, oh loving God, in your presence, that's where I belong. Hi, I'm Laura Murphy. And I'm Matt Murphy. And today we are recognizing that in 2005, Bedford United Church became an affirming ministry. We're excited that Reverend Matt has asked us to share with you today why the affirming ministry is important to us. We're both cisgendered and heterosexual. So our reasons are less about being affirmed ourselves, but more about being in a community that welcomes and respects everyone. I joined BUC in the summer of 2009. I like to joke that BUC was sort of my wingman in winning Laura over when we met at the Mount that fall. I had been church shopping since I was relatively new to Halifax. Uh, this came up in conversation and Matt told me about some of the awesome things that were happening at BUC. When I came to BUC, I'd never heard of an affirming ministry, but the rainbow on the sign and on the UCC crest on the bulletin made it pretty clear what that was about. On top of that, I was really excited about a Sunday school lesson that wove in the elements of the Big Bang with the creation story. It's in one of Ralph Milton's story Bibles, if you want to check it out. I grew up Presbyterian, so United wasn't too far out of my comfort zone, but I was really impressed with the idea of an inclusive church that opposed some of the more rigid parts of my childhood church. All of this made it very clear that all are welcome all the time. This wasn't just a call and response. This was and is at the core of BUC, what it means to be affirming. Fast forward five years and we were looking for a venue for our wedding. No slight to BUC. Our reception venue was downtown. The vast majority of our guests were from out of town or from out of province. It was a non-negotiable for us that our wedding had to happen in an affirming church. We have friends and family who are part of the LGBTQ2S plus community, and we couldn't imagine getting married in a church that would not allow them to get married there. Fast forward another five and a half years, and we have three little ones who absolutely adore running around the aisles and snuggling with people that they only see in church on Sunday. Well, we have three now. Lucy hasn't been to BUC yet, soon. Right, good point. At any rate, having kids kind of doubled down on the importance of us going to an affirming church. We want our children to grow up in a community that welcomes everyone and that celebrates what makes each of us unique. I mentioned this in a service earlier this year that I joined the inclusivity committee because I believe in the church as a conduit for social justice and equity. My hope is that by growing up in an affirming church, my children will see the inequity of our world and that they will work with the church to dismantle systems of oppression. We also recognize that our kids are still living in the genders that we assigned to them. We do our best to explain gender and how it's important to love who you love. We talk regularly about how everyone is valuable and everyone deserves love, but we want them to hear this message from people other than just mom and dad. That's why we keep coming to BUC, to see this message in action in our church community a community where they can question, where they can learn and be who they are without judgment and without fear. 
It's a community where they can see individuality celebrated by a community that is one in the spirit. That's what it means to be welcome all the time. All right. We are excited to announce that the Fresh Lobster fundraiser is back on now that the COVID restrictions have changed. It will happen on Saturday, June 19th over the Father's Day weekend. The lobster will be caught that morning in Cape Breton and delivered live to Bedford United that same day for you to pick up. The cost is $11 per pound, and if you would like your lobster to be cooked before pickup, we are charging an additional $1 per lobster to cover the propane costs. We have two weeks to make this a really successful fundraiser for BUC, so please get the details from this slide or the weekly email or the church's Facebook page and get your orders in. And please share the ordering information with your family this is the time in our worship when we recognize the blessings we have and we give in accordance to those blessings through the gift of time, talent, or monetary means. There are many ways to give, through volunteering, through pre-authorized remittance, envelopes dropped off at the church, um, e-transfer, etc. They're all outlined on our church website, which we invite you to check out. We so appreciate all who continue to contribute to BUC and all who serve our church in so many ways so that uh, our outreach goes out into this world, into our community. One way of our givings are being used this month is we are contributing $215 to our M&S fund through the Healing Fund. This was a suggestion put out by Reverend Catherine McDonald, and our uh, church council has agreed to do that. So on our behalf, they'll be sending $215 for those children. For all of these gifts, we give thanks, and we ask God's blessing on it this day. Amen. Would you take a moment with me now as we lift our hearts and our minds in prayer? Creator God, we give thanks for this day, and each day you grant us life to walk on this great land, our Mother Earth. We have so much for which to be thankful, and our hearts are full of gratitude, but there's also so much hurt and pain in some of our lives. This week we experienced grief at the death of John Ashcroft and Peter Christie, two faithful members of our congregation. And we pray for Marg, Joan, and their families. We also pray for the families who have lost loved ones through this pandemic and lift them up to you that you may bring comfort. For all who are suffering illness, undergoing treatment, waiting for test results, we pray and ask your healing spirit to be with them. For our teachers and our children as they return to school, in the midst of a lot of confusion. Give us the heart and strength to come together in a time of mourning, reflection, and peace. The news we have heard these last few days of our relations, our families, the children who have been physically taken away from their families who have now been found. May their spirits find peace and their bodies be returned to their families and homes. Holy One, let this moment of shock and horror transform us, that we might be instruments of healing through our actions, through our right actions, seeking truth, reconciliation, and justice for all your children. These things we pray in the name of our Creator and in the name of our brother Jesus. Amen. As we gather to celebrate 96 years of ministry that is closely entwined with the history of Canada itself, we do so acknowledging that we have been able to accomplish this project, this union on traditional lands of people who lived here long before any settlers showed up. 
The United Church was inaugurated on June 10, 1925 in Toronto, Ontario, when the Methodist Church, the Congregational Union of Canada, and 70% of the Presbyterian Church of Canada entered into a union. Also joining was a small general council of union churches centered largely in Western Canada. It was the first union of churches in the world to cross historical denominational lines and received international acclaim. Each of the founding churches had a long history in Canada prior to 1925. The movement for church union began with a desire to coordinate ministry in the vast Canadian Northwest and for collaboration in overseas missions. Congregations in Indigenous communities from each of the original denominations were an important factor in the effort toward church union. The United Church of Canada continues to be a uniting church and has been enriched by several additional unions since 1925. In 1930, the Synod of the Wesleyan Methodist Church of Bermuda became part of the United Church of Canada's Maritime Conference. The Evangelical United Brethren Church became part of the United Church of Canada in 1968. In addition, various individual congregations from other Christian communions have become part of the United Church over the years. Today, the United Church ministers to over 2 million people through about 3,000 communities of faith or congregations. In April and May, ministry personnel from across the United Church of Canada joined together in song. Almost 70 singers sent in videos. Musicians from across the church and the Prince George Conservatory of Music created the accompaniment track. Together, we offer you this gift from ministry personnel to the church that we love so much.
as we depart today, may we be brave, may we be strong, may we be humble, may we be gentle with one another. But most of all, may we see the face of Christ in everyone we meet, and may everyone we meet see the face of Christ in us. And now as I extinguish our candles, along with the wind, we are reminded as the smoke goes forward, rises in the wind, that our spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, the spirit unites us all and sends us on our way. Amen. each other up every day we fly we bring each other down it's so stressful turn the attitude around and be successful always remember to share and include keeping our pride is what we're daring to do my friends i like to support i know that life is too short i want to reach out and change the world around me today I want to see progress, cause all I'm seeing is the nonsense This is the process, so I'm riding with my people and we got this Our love is the food for the thoughtless Make the best of everything you've got You have the power inside your heart Let's tell the world that we're all the same And heal together when we all feel pain Let's make the best of every day we see Combine the colors of you and me Let's tell the world, let's tell the world Discover just what we can be Is any 
somebody 